So I have a secret. I have a secret I want to share with you that not many people know. It's my love language. It's not quality time. It's not acts of service. You ready? Boston cream donuts. <laughs> I absolutely love them. To the best. You know, it's not really about the donut, but it's how I got the donut. So let me share with you a little story. This is me and my sister. If you can't tell, I'm the one with the 1986 Eddie Murphy, Michael Jackson, Beat It video jacket on. Okay? And looking good. But in front of that building, where we were, was in a city called New Haven, the state of Connecticut. And we lived just a few blocks away from a local soup kitchen where every Thursday night we would have dinner. And the best part of that dinner was that dessert at the end because you know why? Boston cream donuts. So I would sit through that rye, dry bread, the seasonless mashed potatoes, the frozen peas that by the end of the night between me and my sister, we would just end up using them as table weapons. But alas, my hero would come from that corner with a black trash bag over his shoulder of garbage, mashed, discarded donuts. And he'll plop that big bag on the middle of the floor, and everyone would just rush in. They'd be turned into Mad Max characters. And I would jump in and throw my little elbows and dig into that bag of mashed donuts to find my treasure, that Boston cream. And the best part of that was walking home because I'll share that delicious treat with my sister and my friends in the neighborhood because we lived in a thriving, vibrant community where at night we would play tag, where we would go over each other's houses and play Nintendo and their cousins became my cousins. And we had these epic double dutch battles in the summertime and I can still remember the face and the mustache on the bodega owner on the, on the corner who would give my mother credit on groceries when we didn't have it. And credit wasn't based on scores. It was based on trust. This same year, my sister and I were sitting on these same steps, a cold, winter morning as we watched our clothes, our toys, our entire lives get bagged up in black trash bags. From the apartment building all the way to the curb, our entire lives were shoved into a moving truck. And I was hiding my face in my sweater because I didn't want my friends from their window to see the tears that was coming down my eyes because I was in mourning. I was in mourning knowing that my community is going to end. It's like being at your own wake. The university where we lived just two blocks away called Yale but millions and millions and millions of miles from the engagement of the university had decided to expand faculty housing. So they bought our house, they bought our block, and they bought my neighborhood. So no more epic double dutch battles, no more playing tag in the street lights, no more dinners 
at our pseudo cousins' houses, and absolutely no more sharing of Boston cream pies. You know, New Haven is a classic tale of these two cities where institutions are often housed in other sorts of communities. And New Haven in the 90s, crime rate was far greater than the national average. And disparity was so great that you could see the difference from one side of the street to the other. That you would see on one side of the street, professors with twill jackets and patches on the other side of the street who would be playing playgrounds that were filled with crack vials. And from that moment, I knew I wanted to be a social worker. I wanted to be that person that could advocate for all of those who have lived their lives in black trash bags. I wanted to be that person that could give a voice to the voiceless that who often are designed out of the planning process, who were not included as a part of this new community that was being created for us. We had no choice. We had no relocation assistance. We had no idea where we were going. All we knew was that everything had ended. My loss of community, my loss of big loggingness, and my support system was gone. And now I'm a faculty professor at another institution. And I arrive on campus, and every time I arrive, I arrive in a state of dual consciousness, where on one hand, I have this very lived experience where I know what it's like to be displaced by institutions making decisions for communities. I know what it's like to have that loss. And on the other hand, I have this reality where I work for an institution that has its own history of community accountability. And it gets hard. It's real hard. And the only way I know how to live and exist in these two worlds is to immerse myself in community-engaged scholarship. And Andrew Vandeven coined this term, engaged scholarship, is when community members, practitioners, academics, researchers, all collaborate together to be able to solve real-world problems problems, these wicked problems that plague communities so often don't get resolved in isolation. Because in the words of W.E.B. Du Bois, he states that education must not simply teach work, it must teach life. That this ecosystem must be created where transformation happens when there's radical inclusion. And radical inclusion means that all have ownership, all have value, and all have responsibility. And this happens when we first begin to design in the most vulnerable, take a strong consideration and recognition about the historical injustices that have happened to that community, the power imbalances, the, divide, the diverse needs of that specific community and understanding that it's localized, not generalized. And this type of transformation begins to occur when we all work together because it's not about these ones and zeros, who is and who's not. It's that collectively we create this beautiful code, this beautiful code of community transformation. But in isolation, they create binaries of separation that create a larger birth of disparities that exist. And that our community credible messengers and returning citizens and family members like my mother, who's a single mother and lives with schizophrenia, like my brother who spent most of his life in the carceral system, like my friends who have died in the hands of gun violence, all have value, all have worth, all have responsibility. My sister in this work, Jamila Davis, spent 11 and a half years in federal prison. 11 and a half years. And upon her release that same year, she was able to create a national learning academy where young people 
were able to be able to learn about social justice advocacy, learn about entrepreneurship. But one program in particular, which we created, that I'm very proud of, is the peer-to-peer -peer mental health ambassadorship program, where we included young people to be able to design for themselves what does community safety and belongingness looks like for them. They were the ones who not only were invited, but they designed, they executed, strategized, they created localized strategies about inclusion so that the first line of mental health support came from them, this mutual aid as a protective factor. You wanna know what the beauty of all that is? They were all compensated, they were all paid to participate because that asylee who newly arrived to that school and participated in this program did not have to choose between working a job under the table and finding community and having that level of support. And this ecosystem is not solely with institutions and young people, it's with government also is engaged in this work where corporations are engaged in this work. Like in the city of Newark, New Jersey, there's one mic, one city, one hood, one Newark program, in which the city is engaging with returning citizens to be the first line of support for public safety, to be the peacekeepers on their block. So rather than waiting for them to commit a crime, what we're, what we're doing is that we're engaging with them to prevent recidivism. And they're being trained into how to identify emotions, how to begin to create peacekeeping, how to have financial literacy to break that intergenerational cycle. And they were all compensated. Because as Maslow's hierarchy of needs state, we have to have our immediate needs met before we could talk about community accountability, before we could deal with our trauma that we've experienced as children. So that means that they don't have to worry about eating today or attending a community peace rally session. They don't have to worry about who's gonna watch my child in order for me to attend this planning meeting and be present. All have voices, all are included, all have ownership. So I invite you today, so I want you to bring up this image of who is on your board of trustees. Who is on your board of director? Bring that up. And are any of those members from the community? And are any of those members credible messengers who have that lived experience? And for those of us who work for companies or organizations, identify the partnerships that exist. Is it just donations when it's back to school time? Is it simply when it's Christmas season and we want to have some toys for tots? Or are we creating sustainable long-term partnerships that addresses these wicked problems? The next time we are at a community planning meeting, I want us to look around that room. And rather than being able to identify who's in that room, identify who's not. And why not? Because as we create community transformation, it means that all have ownership. And just like that bag of discarded donuts, thrown out yesterday donuts, we got to dig in and find that beautiful Boston cream. Because it has value, although discarded, it is not forgotten. I'm that Boston cream. I represent all of those lives and community members whose community has been rewritten for them. And although discarded, they're not forgotten. For those of us here in this room who may not look like others want you to look, identify, born the wrong side, different side of the tracks, and have been discarded. You are that Boston cream. We are that treasure that can transform communities. 
that though we may have been discarded by society, we all have value. We all have ownership. We all have responsibility. Because that little boy looking to a sister for answers that she could not give, they had no choice. There was nothing that they could do. Now, this is all I do. All I do to ensure that the resources I have co-design community belongingness and create transformation where all have value. Our credible messengers, our community members, our houseless individuals, our undocumented. Because in the words of my good friend, colleague, social justice advocate, who said it best, those who are closest to the problem are the ones closest to the solution. Thank you.